And so now, um, I am so excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Mark Peterson. He is, uh, he lived in Korea for 15 years. He's got, he's an academic scholar on Korean culture, but more importantly, um, I, I had the honor of seeing him speak at that Shijo Poetry Hip Hop event at Andrew Bay Gallery. He's a lively spokesperson, a real advocate for Korean culture, and just a lovely personality. So let's welcome Professor Mark Peterson. Korea in the late Joseph period. 
Uh, late Joseph Korea was the most Confucian society of any type society there ever was. Why is this so? And how did this happen? I'm greatly interested in this, and I wrote a book or two on it. Uh, I'm interested in Confucianism on the ground. I'm not much interested in philosophy. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, I'm more of a sociologist and a social historian. My undergraduate degree was in anthropology, not philosophy. And I'm interested in how Confucianism is practiced and what people do. And if you look at the documents, if you look at genealogy documents, at inheritance documents, uh, things that indicate son preference, adoption documents, chess off, practice, marriage customs, and village organization, you see Confucianism as it's practiced in Korea. I'm going to look at these seven things and show you how they've changed in Korea in the last uh, few centuries, okay? Uh, Confucian society, the thing I'm interested in, is often called Puget Sape. In English, it's called patrilineal society. That's an awkward term. It's sort of a pedantic academic term. And nobody talks about patrilineal society in English, but uh, outside of the academic world. But in Korea, uh, Puge society, Puge Sape, everybody knows. Everybody knows Puge. And there's an assumption that before Puge, there was something else. And it's a, there's a naive assumption that there was Boge before there was Puge. There was matrilineal society before there was patrilineal society. This is absolutely false. It is absolutely false. There is absolutely no data that shows that Korea was a matrilineal society at any time. So before it was patrilineal, what was it? It was bilateral, meaning it was balanced between the, the genders, where each side uh, had equal access to inheritances, and uh, marriage practices were on an equal basis, not on a uh, male-dominated basis. So uh, if uh, Korean society has not been around forever in Korea, before that it was, it was bilateral. So let's look at bilateral society. One way you can do this is look at Chokpo. Uh, this is a typical chokpo, and in this chokpo you can see uh, the typical male line, father to son to son to son, and after each son, the daughters recorded, the son and then the daughters. It was in previous day, nam san yoku, men first the women later. But in early days, chokpo looked, looked like this. This is an early chokpo, this is the Andro Munchi chokpo, this is the oldest chokpo in Korea. And here we can see as things were different. Look at this family here. Daughter, 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 son, son, daughter. Recorded in the, in the natural birth order. Not son first and daughter second. Also, in this document, the daughter's line was continued in as much detail as was the son's line. So in early chosen, it was different. It was bilateral. Uh, I, there's another kind of chokpo out there that you may not be familiar with. And to understand this chokpo, let me ask you a question. How many Kojo Hanabati do you have? How many great great grandfathers do you have? Hmm? How many Kojo Hanabati do you have? One, right? One. Two? One. One? Aneo! You have one Abhiji, one Omani. How many grandfathers do you have? Two. Han Abhiji. You say Chin Han Abhiji, Wei Han Abhiji. You say, you should say Han on the father's side, Han on the mother's side, okay? I have two daughters. Two daughters. Two daughters. I have two daughters. I can never be Chin Han Abhiji. <laughs> I can only be
see the branches going up. This is more of a family tree than the Western pedigree chart that we talk about when we talk about a family tree. This family tree is leaning on its side. Right? The Korean family tree in the old days was upright. Uh, and it clearly shows that in the early days, Korean kinship was bilateral, both sides. Okay? Now, this document I showed you, this one here, is not an unusual document. There are hundreds of these. This is the way kinship was reckoned in the early days. Okay? Uh, inheritance documents. This, you guys not looking that long enough, inheritance documents. This is a inheritance document of the famous scholar Yurgo Sunseng. Yurgo Sunseng is this man right here, number three. And each of the children, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, who was Yurgo Sunseng's mother? She signed up. She had seven children. And they were boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. <laughs> and you see in this inheritance document that the amount of property, land and slaves, given to each of the children, male or female, older or younger, was exactly the same. This too is not unusual. There were a lot of documents like this in the early days. This is the inheritance document of Shin Sai Dong herself. The thing that's interesting about Shin Sai Dong is she was one of five sisters, no brothers. If she had lived 200 years later, she and her five sisters would have been true Gawain. <laughs> she would have been sent out to marriage and they would have adopted a nephew to inherit the family line. But not at her time. At her time, inheritances were divided equally between sons and daughters, and if there was no son, just between the daughters. And this is her document, okay? So that's looking at genealogy and inheritance document. We see in Korea an idea of son preference. When did this develop? This idea that you must have a son. At the time of Shin Sai Dong, you didn't have to have a son. Uh, and the idea of, this is a very esoteric, esoteric term, agnatic adoption. Agnatic adoption means to adopt someone from within your lineage group, meaning the patrilineal lineage group, meaning the men related to men through men. Uh, and Chesa practice came to be practiced by uh, the Chong the Song, the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son. But in the early days, in Korea, Chesa was practiced on this basis, Yun Hang, Yun Hang. Yun Hang means taking turns. Because property was divided equally between sons and daughters, they took turns participating in the ceremonies and hosting the ceremonies. Now, as an American, I can understand this because when we have a holiday in America, sometimes it's Easter is at Emo's house, Fourth of July we go to Como's house, Labor Day, we all go to the Chaganabhi's house. <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, we go to our house. Christmas Chandal, we go to uh, Chaganimo's house. And, and Christmas Nal, we go to Kunabhi's house. Right? Right. It's in rotation. That's the way they used to do it in Korea. In the later times, under the Puga system, it all becomes in the hands of the Chongsong and, this, and the eldest son and the eldest son. And this, this writing we find, Muri Yun Hang. No more Yun Hang. The eldest son has to step up and do it. So there was a change that took place in Korea. Uh, marriage customs too, we saw a change, we see a change. When you get married in Korea, when you're learning Korean, When you in the old days in Korea, you would shiki kada or you would changa kada. Where was your gok sun saying born? Where was your gok sun saying born? At Ochukon. Where is, whose house is Ochukon? Shin Sai Dong's house. His father's changa kata. And there are many, many cases in the early days of Changa Kanda. You all have a Pungwan. Have you ever lived in your 
Pongguan? Your Pongguan is a long, long time ago, right? That's where an ancestor lived a long time ago. Why did your ancestor leave the Pongguan? If it was always Chichipada, the man would still be living in the Pongguan. But in the early days of Korea, you were Changa Kaguna, Shiji Kaguna. Each side would inherit property, so you'd go to the house that was most convenient, the husband's house or the wife's house. You know, the village organization changed as well. You know, uh, you know the uh, Yangban village, the Sicheng Chong, the single surname village? That's a late development in Korea. In the early days, you didn't have that. That only developed with the Puge Sabe. So when did the Puge Sabe develop? I wrote a book on it. I wrote it in English. And to get it out there, I wanted to make sure people understood it, so I wrote it in Korean. Can you read this? Yugoslavia, Changchu. Young people, but they can't read it. <laughs> in fact, the publisher told me that this was the last book in 1998, the last book they published with Hanta on the cover. <laughs> it's now all Hanta on all the covers. Uh, here's a riddle. What happens to a PhD dissertation? You write a PhD for six, eight, ten years, what happens to it? It becomes a paragraph in the textbook. <laughs> this big dissertation turns into one paragraph in the next textbook. My dissertation has not yet appeared in the textbook. I've written about the development of Kuge Sangre and it has not yet appeared in the Korean textbooks. I keep it in mind. <laughs> That's why I created the Umur Pake Kebri Yungusso. It's not really a Yungusso, it's a Undong kind of So when did Korea become Confucianized? When did the Puge Sahara begin? We've seen that before it was Puge, but not Boge, it was Yangbyan Tendu Sahara, okay? When did it happen? I drew a chart. Those Songso, Songso Munso, those inheritance documents, up until a point in the late 17th century, daughters got equal amounts to sons. Then it drops off and drops down to nothing. This is when daughters become disinherited. At the same time, I found data on adoptions. And adoptions grew throughout the Chosun period. You put these two charts together, and X Hyung is right at the end of the 17th century. When did Korea become Confucianized? The end of the 17th century. Most of you have been taught that this happened at the beginning of the Chosun Dynasty. That's wrong by 300 years. It did not happen at the founding of the Chosun Dynasty. The founding of the Chosun Dynasty, Korea became politically Confucianized. They adopted political institutions and governmental institutions, but society took another 300 years to change. Okay? Uh, so in other words, Confucianism came into Korea during the time of the Three Kingdoms period. But for a thousand years, that Confucianism was Conf Korean-style Confucianism. A liberal Confucianism, where sons and daughters were recognized equally. It's only been in the last 300 years, with the adoption of the Puge system, that Korea has become so orthodox and so stiff and stodgy about its Confucianism. So there are two kinds of Confucianism in Korea. One lasted a thousand years, and then one has lasted 300 years. That's what I mean by a proper understanding of Confucianism. TED Talk number two, about an upbeat history. Uh, what is history? It is not a list of facts of bygone days. Rather, it's interpretation of data and an explanation of how we got to where we are today. History is today. History is an explanation of how we got to be where we are today. That's the important part of history is today. Uh, for Korea, the 20th century has been sad. Korea was one of the poorest, most beaten up countries on the planet in the, in the 20th century. And its history looked like that. But Korea, Korea today is a powerful, strong country, and its history ought to change to describe how it got to be so powerful. Uh, the story of Korea from the 20th century, of this poor, beaten up country, the story of war and invasions, is not the story we need in the 21st century. I am skeptical of the multiple invasion story that I hear about Korea. When I talk to Koreans, they say, oh, we've been invaded by so many countries. We've been invaded so many times. Every country in the world has invaded Korea. <laughs> it's not true. 
sad. It's a beat up story that I really dislike and I want to suggest something different to you. How many invasions were there? How many invasions were there? Many people say there were several hundreds. I've seen some people say there were several thousand invasions. <laughs> if you talk about several hundred, especially several thousand, every pirate raid you're counting as an invasion. <laughs> That's nonsense. How many invasions were there really? I say two. I say only two. And I'll defend it. The two that were serious invasions were the Mongol invasion and the Hideyoshi invasion of 1592. You say, no, 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 what about the Manchu? What about the Penga Horan, the, the Chandra Horan? The Manchus invaded not to conquer and, and, dis, and destroy Korea. The Manchus invaded to make Korea their ally. It was a completely different thing. That's why they invaded twice. They came in once, they got the king surrendered to recognize them, and then they left. They didn't go marauding and killing everybody in the countryside the way the Japanese and the Mongols did. They left. And the, and the Korean king secretly went to the Ming emperor and said, hey, we've been attacked by the Manchus. Let's attack the Manchus together, Fukuo, the northern attack. It never materialized. And the Manchus found out about Korea's going to the Ming dynasty and said, oh, we'll come in again. This time, king, you better surrender. And to make sure you keep your word, we're taking your three sons, right, as hostage. But as soon as they conquered China, they let the three sons go. The Manchu invasion was a very, very different kind of invasion. How many countries invaded Korea? Oh, is it China? Well, okay. The Sui, the Sui Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty tried to invade Koguryo. Who won each of those invasions? Koguryo. They repelled them each time. So that's a very different kind of invasion. If you lose, or if you win, it's different. How many times has China invaded Korea? How, how about the Tang Dynasty and Shila? They formed an alliance. Shila invited Tang to come in. That's a very different kind of thing. So if you look at it and you analyze what these invasions are all like, now when you get to the 20th century, it becomes more, more complicated. The 20th century again, Korea is all beat up, right? And uh, you, you talk about the Japanese taking over at the start of the 20th century. Where was the invasion? They fought against the, the Chinese, the Qing Dynasty. They came in to defend Korea from the Tonghak Rebellion. But from there on, there was not a landing to conquer Korea. The takeover of Korea was not political. And then you talk about the invasion from North Korea to South Korea. Okay, that's an invasion. You ought to count that one. And that's Korea against Korea. So I want to dismiss these other ones. And if you want to, if you want to pick at it, I'll, I'll be forced to say, okay, 20th century is set aside, and after the three kingdoms, that middle period, you only had two invasions. Two major invasions, okay? Now, this new perspective, though, where, where, if I'm going to offer a new perspective, where does the old perspective come from? Why does Korea say we've had so many invasions? Number one, it's a Japanese point of view. It's advantageous for the Japanese to say, oh, you've been invaded so many times that when we take over, that's okay. You've been subservient to China, now you'll be subservient to us. These are lies that are told by the Japanese. Okay? And also, it's advantageous to the military governments, Park chun and Chandra Wan, to say we've had lots of invasions because now we have to rev up and prepare to fight and be a good, strong military country. But let's look at the opposite point of view. Let's look at the not so many invasion perspective. I, my point of view is that Korea is the most stable, has the most peaceful history of any country on the planet. Just the opposite of what most of you have been taught, what most of you think. What's the evidence? I got lots of evidence for it. Okay, we're going to go through these one at a time. There have been very few invasions. We covered that a little bit. When there was war, it was fairly brief in time. When Europe had a war, it went for 30 years went for a hundred years. You didn't have that kind of long span of war in Korea. Uh, the longest unchanged border in the world, the longest of all the dynasties in the world, smooth transition between dynasties, tombs, unrobbed tombs, officials, and the Kims. Let's go over these one at a time. Long dynasties. Korea has the longest dynasties of any country in the world. The average dynasty in most countries is 250 years. Korea's shortest dynasty is 500 years. There are some countries that claim to have 
800. The Chou Dynasty in China claims to be a thousand years, but that's mostly myth. The Shila Dynasty had a true history for a, a thousand years, the longest dynasty on the planet. Not only that, the dynasties, when they changed, changed in a rather peaceful manner. From Kaya to Shila is the first case. You know, Kim Yushin, the great Shila general, was a Kaya man. He came into the Kaya kingdom as a, as a chingo on the rank system. So Kaya was absorbed by Shila, a peaceful transition, okay? Then from Shila to Koryo, Hugo Uryo was a protector of Shila. And the transition from Shila to Koryo was relatively smooth. The transition against Hukekte was not so smooth. But again, from Shila to Koryo was relatively smooth. And then from Koryo to Chosun, when you look at a dynasty, the transition from dynasty, you can ask two questions. How long did it take and how many people died? In most cases, transition from one dynasty to the next is 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. How long did the transition from Koryo to Chosun take? One afternoon. <laughs> Yi Sung Ye came back from Wiwago and took over, just like that. How many people died? Precious few. Usually when a dynasty changes, there are tens of thousands of people that die. I like to say when this transition took place, two people died. Che Young, the Sandy Sung Gao the Wild Goose Chase, and Chung Ong Ju, who decided to die out of loyalty to the Koryo King. Raise his hand. He said, 
uh, where were these tombs robbed? And I said, well, these tombs haven't been robbed. And he said, oh, yes, they have. The tombs are always robbed. That's what they're for. <laughs> That's where the gold is. The tombs are robbed. And I said, no, these tombs haven't been robbed. When the archaeologists have dug into seven of them, they've got the gold crown and the gold belt and the jewels. It's all there. And I'd already told this group about my theory of Korea's stable history. This archaeologist said, oh, that's a pretty good indication of stable history. There was never enough chaos in Korea to rob the tombs. Korean tradition is civilian. What's the ideal in Japan? The Sahara. What's the ideal in Korea? The Sunbeam, this call. The Sunbeam even shows up on the money. And who is this king? It's not Tejong, the son of the founder of the Chosun dynasty. It's not Wang Gon, the founder of the Quarter dynasty. It's not uh, uh, Muyo Wang, the unifier of Sheila. It's the Sunbi Suro Omar. It's the king who is also a Sunbi. That's who's on the money. Okay, the clincher on TED Talk 2. Why are there so many Kims in Korea? Okay, I've been, to, I've been in and out of Korea for the last 54 years. And I just figured this out about six months ago. Because I've always been taught, oh, kimchi manta, ishi do manko, pashi do manko, ramsane do donji men, kimchi pashi manta. No explanation of why there's so many kims. Well, I think I know now. It's not like other countries. Kims are 21% in Korea. E's are 15%, Pots are 9%. What's the most common name in Japan? It's not Tanaka, it's not Suzuki, it's Sato. What percentage of people are named Sato in Japan? 1.5%. Completely different from Korea. In fact, every other country is completely different from Korea. The most common name in America is Smith. And in the UK, it's Smith. The most common name in Germany is Mueller, but it's not even 1%. The most common name in, in Spain is Garcia. The most common name in Saudi Arabia is not Mohammed, it's Khan. It's about 5%. Every other country in the world, with the exception of, oops, Vietnam. In Vietnam, Nguyen is 38%. But that's phony. Because the Win Dynasty was the last dynasty, a lot of people changed the name to accommodate the new, the new king, and the king gave the name to a lot of people. It's not an organic factor. Korea is really unusual on the, on the planet. There's so many people named Kim. Why? Why are there so many people named Kim? How many surnames are there in Korea? About 250. How many surnames are there in Japan? About 100,000. <laughs> the Korean consciousness of names is completely different from Japan and from every other country on the planet. Why are there so many Kims, E's, and Pox in Korea? It's because of the stable, peaceful history. The ruling class of Sorobo was Kim, E, and Pox, and has continued till the present day. In every other country, when a dynasty falls, the ruling class of that dynasty is virtually destroyed. I figured this out when at school I met a young woman from Japan, and she, named, she said her name was Fujiwara. I said, and I studied Japanese history, so I said, Fujiwara? I've never met a Fujiwara. That was the royal family of the Heian period. Because I knew that, she said, yeah, there's no power of the royal family. Then she said, there aren't many of us that survive. And that's the way it usually is. When the dynasty falls, the ruling class is eliminated or nearly eliminated. In Korea, the ruling class never fell. Shila continued on into Koryo. Koryo continued on to Chosun. And we're living in Korea today, not in the Tianmingu, not in the Tianmingu group, but the Sorobon Mingu. The, the names of Shila are alive and well in Korea today. It's a symbol of the stability of Korea, okay? So now, if somebody says, hey, why are there so many kids in Korea? Don't say, oh, I throw a rock and hit one. <laughs> say, it's a symbol of our stable, peaceful history. Okay. 
TED Talk number three, Shijo. Uh, I spent most of my time on the first two, just briefly on Shijo. Uh, I really enjoyed my working with uh, Lucy Park on the Shijo seminars that we've done. We're doing one in two more weeks in Indiana. And uh, the objective of the Korea of the Sejong Cultural Society, we've seen the music programs and the essay contest and the Shijo contest. I see it as one, two, three. Uh, my objectives of the Frog Outside the Well are Confucianism, Renewed History, and the Shijo. Our two Shijo Venn diagrams overlap. We both have a great interest in Shijo. Uh, the objectives are slightly differently articulated, though. You've heard about the uh, wanting to teach Korean culture to Americans and using Shijo as one of the vehicles for it. I come from it from the haiku perspective. How many of you know what haiku is? Raise your hand. How many of you do not do not know what haiku is? Are you afraid to raise your hand? <laughs> in a Korean audience in Korea, when I ask how many of you know what haiku is, nobody raises their hand. You don't study haiku in Korea. But in America, everybody studies haiku. Everybody studies haiku. In my classes, when I'd ask the student before we started on the Shijo if they studied haiku, everybody said they studied haiku. It used to be they studied haiku in high school. Then I found out they're studying high school in junior high school. Now they're studying high school in the third and fourth grade. Okay. One time I asked the students if they all studied high school, and one student, has anybody never studied high school? One student raised his hand. What school did you go to? Got a home school. <laughs> Aside from that, everybody in America studies high school. When I say study, I mean they write high school. They compose their own high school. We need to do the same thing with Shijo. We need to do the same thing with Shijo. I'm trying to do my part. Here's a list of some of the articles I've written for the Korea Times on Shijo. And uh, we've, we've got to do more to help Americans learn the virtue of Shijo. The Japanese have already beat our socks off. <laughs> the Japanese have already won this context. The Japanese, Everybody's learning haiku. And I don't think they made any effort to do it. Haiku is just fun. But Shijo is fun too. We have to get it out there and help the American educational community to understand that. Uh, I was going to take some time, but since I only have 25 minutes, I'm not going to do it. But the, uh, the Shijo that these kids write on the contest are fabulous. They're absolutely wonderful Shijo. They're breathtaking. Uh, one of my favorites is a, a boy who wrote a shijo about his dog. He said, we have a new dog named Emma. My aunt died. Everybody was sad. Mother was distraught. Now I see my aunt in little Emma's eyes, in the eyes of this dog. This beautiful idea. Uh, shijo has so many beautiful ideas. They're simple and sweet, and the student can learn about it and write it. So, we need to teach Shijo not only in America, but we need to teach Shijo in Korea. They don't teach Shijo in Korea. When I teach in my class of, say, 30 students in a given semester, and maybe in a year, 30, 30, 60 students in a class, in a year, 60 Shijo will be written in my classroom. That's more than in all of Korea put together. They don't write Shijo. They study Shijo. They study the old ones. They learn the masterpieces, but they don't write their own. I've been advocating to Korean audiences what they need to do is what we're doing in America. They just have a contest. And these contests should be school by school, and they should have outside readers. So it's a blind, a double blind examination. We don't know who the examiners are, the examiners don't know who the students are, and they rate these Shijo, and then they give them points that can be applied to the student Shijo, the entrance exam. And what we can do with Shijo, we can expand and do it with other poetry, with an essay contest, with a music contest, with a science fair, and Korea can become more creative in its educational programs. What's the criticism I hear of the Korean educational system? It only requires rote memorization. It's not very creative. 
created yet to win a Nobel Prize. This would be one way to get in still creativity into the educational system. So that's what I have to say. That's the outsider's point of view on creative culture and history. Uh, watch my